Hello, and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. This time we have a launch of the EDB shuttle carrying a docking adapter for the Orion 1 space liner. It also has the first segments of the Orion 1 access trusses that will be necessary for engineers to maintain the liner. For this fifth EDB shuttle launch, ETS-5, the commander of the mission is Kathina Kerman, who flew as the backup pilot under Valentina Kerman on both ETS-1 and ETS-2. The engineer is Bill Kerman, who also previously went up on ETS-1 and ETS-2. The scientist is Murgas, who was also scientist on ETS-3. Finally, the backup pilot is Neil Brett, who is commander of ETS-3. All right, looks like we're ready to go. Team has 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, engine start, three, two, one, and liftoff. We have liftoff of ETS-5 to Hoffman Station, delivering the Orion 1 Space Liner adapter. And it looks like Athena Kerman has it. As usual, the payload is different in mass than other payloads on other missions, so there is some wiggle initially as the pilot gets the right feel for the craft. And here we have the roll program. Kathina seems to have it well under control. 500 meters and heading on up. Okay, roll program complete. The shuttle looks stable and the pitch program begins. After input from Twitch viewers, we now have names for the EDB shuttle. The naming convention adopted was uh, using bird names, and the name chosen for this shuttle is Elenoides, also known as the Swallow-Tailed Kite, a reference to the shuttle's tail configuration. Since Elenoides may be difficult for Kerbals to say, it is also known as Elan, that's E-L-A-N. The 1.0.2 version of the shuttle, with fewer air brakes and lacking the drag chute and lights, is now dubbed Garuda, another name for the Phoenix, and that's because while it's currently mothballed in this series, it continues to have a second life in the Twitch transportation system live streams. Okay, it looks like Caffeina has ignited the upper OMS engines to help with stability prior to booster separation. Waiting booster separation here. Boosters out. Boosters separate. And it looks like the boosters are safely clear of the craft. And again, those are recoverable boosters with parachutes. And so uh, their value will be returned to the EDB. Those very expensive engines, of course, we would definitely want to get those back. It looks like Athena had the shuttle at a higher pitch than Hatred did on the previous mission in 1.0.4 with the Illinoides. Uh, so, um, well, we'll see how it works out. Uh, Hatrude had it more like at 40 degrees, which was extremely low pitch uh, for booster separation. Uh, this is more matching what we saw on ETS 1 through 3 in 1.0.2. Okay, uh, Kathina has lit the upper OMS briefly there. It looks like uh, Kathina might have had trouble holding the pitch on lighting the OMS engines. Again, the upper OMS engines are supposed to increase the pitch of the craft and help uh, keep its nose up as it were. And uh, here she lights it again and we see an even more violent move there, possibly because of the mass balance in the payload bay. Perhaps the payload is a little bit unbalanced and causing that. Uh, we'll have to assess that later on, but in any case, Kathina still has good control over the craft. Lighting the upper OMS engines would be helpful to expedite reaching orbit, but they aren't necessary unless the pitch is a problem, and it doesn't look like the pitch is a problem right now. In fact, they seem to be causing more of a problem on their own than uh, we see here. Pitch seems to be well under control, but eventually I'm sure Kathina will try again to light those upper OMS engines. And there we go. And here the upper OMS engines are lit stably and so they are helping to push the shuttle to orbit using up more of the external tank fuel than would otherwise be the case. Here the upper tank on the external tank is unlocked and I've been helping to keep balance until now. Overall the payload is fairly light so it's somewhat of a surprise that there should be any any imbalance at all and so uh, there will be 
some review of the situation after the flight and once the data is all collected here. Here we see that the apoapsis is touching the orbit of the station and there we have engine cutoff, the ignition of the remaining OMS engines and awaiting separation of the external tank here. External tank separation is good and the shuttle will proceed to apoapsis and then light its OMS engines in order to gain full orbit. Now it will have a periapsis of about 80 kilometers in order to phase with the station here. It will still take some time for the shuttle to catch up with the station but that's alright as the KSC is heading into the nighttime side of the planet anyway and uh, the time that it will take to catch up to the station will allow the KSC to move into the daylight side what we see here is that the shuttle had been using mop propellant from the payload on the way up and now had to replenish that mop propellant uh, using its cockpit uh, tank. And the shuttle doesn't have as much mop propellant as it usually does because the docking adapter that's usually forward in the shuttle bay had to be removed to fit this payload. And so uh, uh, the shuttle is in sort of a conundrum here because it's basically going to be lacking its backup RCS system and relying entirely on the Werner engines uh, in order to uh, help with attitude control on the way down on descent. Here we see the correction burn in order to meet up with the station, uh, mostly an inclination burn as you can tell. The long wait before rendezvousing with the station negates the long wait that used to occur after the rendezvous as the shuttle waited for the KSC to get back into daylight and so uh, we will have less of a wait after the rendezvous before descent. Uh, here we see that Kathina has brought the shuttle to within uh, to about 275 meters from the station and will release the payload now. Here we have payload release and unlocking of its mod propellant tank so that it can maneuver out of the payload bay. You can see the forward section is the actual adapter. The other two portions are the arms. The, those are the access arms or access trusses they will sort of wrap around the Orion 1 space plane in order to give engineers access uh, except these are not the full arms these are simply the initial portions of it the initial segments and further segments will have to be launched in later missions uh, here we see that the payload is making its way to the station now there is no controller or RCS on the adapter itself all of the 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 arms have controllers and RCS but the adapter section itself does not and so they have to do all of the maneuvering and so it's somewhat unbalanced here the RCS. The RCS is much better balanced once the adapter is released and the arms go their separate ways. Uh, here is the approach to the station you see it getting close the solar panels displayed there and of course it has to maneuver around all of the obstacles including Jebediah Kerman's GB. I say it has to, but of course it is Jeb controlling it here. And so he's bringing it into dock, making sure it's all nice and lined up, and of course not hitting his own craft. Here's the final phase of the docking of the adapter, after which the, the arms will separate from it. And we can see how tight the fit is here. and it looks like we have some form of magnetism yes there we go and uh, here the arms separate off and you can see the free uh, Clapatron senior docking port there where the Orion 1 will dock safely away from the station the first arm decoupled uh, not entirely safely as uh, it gave a bit of a ricochet there but uh, all of it intact and it subsequently used its RCS and reaction wheel in order to move away from the other arm. There we go. Still not entirely balanced with the RCS, but much better than it was with the docking adapter. Here it's making its way to the station. The side that it's approaching is the one that's most difficult to reach because you can't line up with the docking port ahead of time because of the solar panels in the way there. Uh, the solar panels could have been retracted, but Jeb insisted that he could manage this. Uh, there are camera drones around the station that help give Jeb a view and so he's controlling those as well to 
assure that he has a proper view of the situation in order to make the docking successful. And so you see here the the access truss here is lining up with that docking port on the side of the docking adapter. Here it seems to have a few axes sorted out and can make its approach. Has to be careful of quite a lot of obstacles here and also its own orientation. With so much expensive hardware at stake, of course, it's good that the EDB has their top Kerbinaut on board and at the controls here. And here we see the lineup and waiting for magnetism. Now magnetism could throw the the orientation off and we see it sort of does there. Uh, waiting for connection. We have connection of that arm but it does seem to be tilted down a bit and that would not be good because that could potentially strike the wing of the Orion 1 space liner and so it has to be decoupled and Jeb will have to try again getting the orientation right here. So here we go again lining up with the target. Not much use of RCS here. We've got a lot of mod propellant to spare so it might have been possible to leave the mod propellant with the shuttle but it's a little bit too late for that now. The shuttle itself cannot dock at the station. It doesn't have its docking adapter there yet. Uh, we're prioritizing the Orion 1 space liner and the shuttle's own docking adapter will have to arrive later on. But to here the arm is all set it looks like but upon extending the ladder it was clear that this arm was on the wrong side because that ladder is supposed to connect to those rungs that you see there which lead to the entrance into the station. And so this was actually the wrong side for this arm and Jeb had to undock it again and move it over to the other side, flip it over and dock it there. A bit of a hassle here, a lot of time wasted but again, not much mod propellant, plenty of spare mod propellant. Um, time was of the essence in terms of electric charge because these, these uh, access trusses had a limited electric charge and no ability to, to uh, replenish that. And that's more important for the other truss, uh, which is waiting and also depleting its electric charge. So we'll see how that is doing after this is all docked up. Seems a little bit off here. Jeb needs to scoot that in closer to the station. Okay, well it seems to be lined up now. Just needs to move it closer to that docking port. Full of tense moments here, but this is the easier side. And there we have it. So uh, that arm is all set. Uh, looks like it's lined up all right. Shouldn't hit the wings of the Orion 1 on that orientation. Extending the ladder to make sure it lines up properly with the rungs. And then we should be all set on this side. Then we have to get the other arm over to the tighter side again. And uh, I say we. It's all up to Jeb. There we go. Alright, so uh, let's separate the other arm from its adapter. Uh, a little bit of a violent uh, kick there, but uh, it was alright. Uh, it was already almost 500 meters away from the station when it uh, began to make its journey back. If Jeb was getting tired of doing dockings at this point, he certainly gave no hint of it. Uh, this docking turned out to be the most expedited one of the lot. Uh, probably because he's gotten a lot of practice docking these particular arms, uh, judging their orientation and balance. And so quickly he gets it within the criti critical area of the station, safe of the solar panels. You can see uh, approaching the station quite swiftly, reflecting Jeb's confidence now and lining up just fine. making sure that the orientation is proper, that the arm is rotated correctly. Again, th there may be some deviations once it magnetizes with the target port here. But mission controllers 
decided that that was all right, uh, that this looked to be a good position, and that Jeb had done his, his job here. Extending the ladder, of course, it uh, met up with those rungs on the docking adapter, and this side of the mission is all set. So, Hoffman Station is uh, tentatively ready to receive the Orion 1 Space Liner, though those arms should probably be extended a little bit further. Once you see the Space Liner alongside the station, you'll uh, note how, how incredibly huge the thing is. The station also currently lacks tanks to refuel the liner, and so those will have to be brought up and attached to the opposite side from this docking arm. So counterbalancing the Orion space plane will be the fuel tanks that will refuel it and replenish its supplies. So that is the plan, and uh, for now we will leave the Hoffman station and turn back to the shuttle which has to complete its part of the mission, uh, namely returning the Kerbals safely back to the surface. And so here we are, Kathina Kerman bringing the shuttle down to its standby orbit of 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. And after she does that, she has to do the retro burn down to a periapsis of between 25 kilometers and 26 kilometers is the, the decided upon standard descent periapsis. And once she has that, the shuttle is all set for descent. After that, Kathina has to make sure that the shell is oriented properly along the way, and she decides to start off with air brakes out and a 40 degree pitch, and this hopefully will prevent the need for a go around as we saw on Heytrude's approach, though Heytrude managed that go around without using any fuel. Uh, Kathina did rely on RCS to uh, hold the pitch for the early phase and she kept the brakes out for an extended period of time early on but later on checking on the map she appeared to be falling short of it and so retracted the brakes and moderated her descent uh, going down to 20 degrees to 30 degrees in order to gain a little bit more lift though that probably wasn't necessary as we will soon see uh, here you see the flame effects starting up here Though she looked unaccountably nervous on ascent, Kathina seemed to be quite confident at this point, as did the rest of her crew. As you can see, uh, Bill Murgas and even Neil Brett uh, seemed to be quite, quite happy with the way things were going on the approach to the home continent. The shuttle seemed quite high approaching the western mountain range, as you see there. But despite that fact, uh, because the shuttle was traveling quite slowly, it was still on track to hit the KSC. But it would be a quite a high approach. And so it looks like that is going to be the case for, uh, for the new aerodynamics of Kerbin. Here we see a much more scenic view of the shuttle's approach as Kathina and her crew continue to look quite confident in the way things are going. As is standard, the rapier engines were switched to air breathing mode as that became possible. Unfortunately, the crew seemed quite concerned about their high approach here, but uh, the decision was made to continue on for a direct descent and no go around using the jets. And so Kathina started to turn the shuttle, but there was some imbalance apparent. Uh, Kathina reported some difficulty holding the orientation of the shuttle and so Mission Control decided that they should pump the fuel from the rear cylindrical tanks to the forward cylindrical tanks above the wings just to help the center of mass a bit. And so that's what you see here. Uh, there was no real concern that there would be any danger for the crew but just just in case there was some imbalance that might make things difficult for Kathina on her approach. Uh, the mission control decided to do that. And here we see the final approach, uh, 1,200 meters, 1,100 meters, kilometer, 900, 800, 700, coming in quite fast and to the left, 500 meters, 400, 300, 200, still to the left, 100, 50, 
20, 10, and touchdown. Touchdown confirmed of ETS 5. It breaks the route. Drag shoot is out. Let's see if Kathina managed to get down within the confines of the runway or whether it will overrun a bit. It seems to be safe in any case. Looks to be stopping within the distance of the runway. Just barely. And we have wheel stop. And there we have it, ETS-5, the successful mission of ETS-5, bringing the Orion docking adapter and access arms to Hoffman Station. We hope you enjoyed this Elegant Design Bureau presentation and will join us for future missions. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.